Good afternoon. It's five o'clock on Tuesday, 23rd of February, and welcome to this week's What Comes Next Live. Um, as always in the pandemic, I'm here in London. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Um, my guest this week uh, is in the is up in Scotland, where uh, I have not been for a year. Um, and it's David Ross, who is design director at Kepi, uh, as his day job, and among his other interests, uh, apart from tree surgery, which we were talking about before he came online. Um, for the for those on audio, I am holding up a book, the latest of his novels from Arenda Books. There's only one Danny Garvey. And I have to say, I got a pre-release copy from David and I read it. I decided to indulge in hashtag slow reading. I read it no more than eight pages at a sitting with a slow drink of a cup of coffee because I got a sense the minute I opened it that he was unfolding something quite special. And it was a fantastic piece of work. So um, my guest this week, uh, accomplished uh, man, of, man of parts of Scotland. I'm sure he can talk about which parts he affiliates with most. Somewhat football fan of a couple of dodgy teams. <laughs> um, a really smart design director, um, David Ross. Over to you, sir. Thanks very much. Um... It's good to be talking to you. I'm, I'm in Kilmarnock, uh, which is uh, not that far from Glasgow. Um, it's in a region, uh, Ayrshire region, uh, and I'm very, very fond of Ayrshire and Kilmarnock, although I'm Glaswegian uh, born, um, adopted uh, down here when probably about 30 odd years ago. Um, and it's, it's kind of it's probably where my heart is now. Um, it's a really intriguing uh, idea to consider what comes next, which is you know the, the title that Tom gave me before uh, to think about, and you know I, I, it it made me think that you know our architects generally are, are sort of paid to answer that question, you know um, whether it's for an individual or for an organisation or for a sector or for a city, even you know the the, the consideration of what's in front of us and what comes next for short, mid and longer term is kind of what we're trained to do, you know. Um, but I think even even architects have been put to the test over this last sort of 12 months or so. And I don't, I, I didn't really want to talk too much about life pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. I think that it's maybe a wee bit too melodramatic. Um, but I, I think also maybe just the age I've reached, you know, that question's now beginning to become something that I'm sort of preoccupied with on a personal level and on a professional level. And because I'm, you know, the the, the leader, uh, one, of the, one of the four partners of a business that's been running for 160 years, then the what happens next from a corporate point of view is also um, a, a very topical consideration at the minute. Um, and, you know, I... I also made me wonder when the question was posed that we used to think about this all the time, subliminally, you know, mm. constantly planning for holidays, constantly thinking about, um, you know, what would happen next year or what we would do this year or, you know, um, and I don't know whether it made me feel that do, do we ever, do creative people ever really live in the moment that much, you know, um, if, if you're, if, if your entire professional education is about imagining a future thing, you know, or a future environment or using what skills you've got to kind of analyse how things have been, to understand how they are, to then explore how they might be in the future. You know, that, that's my entire creative life has been, has revolved around those things, you know. Um, I, I, your question made me wonder am I ever really that good at kind of accepting things for what they are and living in the moment, whatever that moment is, you know? Um, and maybe that's something I've kind of learned to do a bit better this year over the last 18 months. And I, I suppose, you know, the question of what comes next prompts, it prompts other questions about how has, you know, the current set of circumstances changed you or, you know, made you feel differently about either your own life or, you know your own creativity you know um it's an interesting thing you know and I, I, I often wonder whether what is it that drives people to and you know, maybe particularly creative people to constantly be thinking about what is happening next or what comes next for them in a creative context um you know and, and, it, and it 
maybe it maybe made me wonder: is that a fear of being irrelevant at some point, or is that a fear of just standing still constantly? You know, and I think that's what it is. I I, I think I've got a fear of living in the moment right now, um, and maybe it's a personal thing that maybe that's never really been enough. You know. I don't know. So you posed a really interesting question that's going to probably lead me to therapy at some point in the next in the next ten years or so. But in, in terms of trying to answer it, I think what comes next um, personally um, is probably a lot more short term than it's been for a long time. You know, um, can I see beyond the next haircut, the next dental appointment, um, the next opportunity to actually be with other people? You know. Um, that's a really, you know, when we when we looked at what we wanted to do in the future, uh, it might have been fly around the world or it might have been bungee jump off the Eiffel Tower or something like that. You know, it's strange now that that's, that question's focused down to just the everyday life things that we took for granted 15 months ago, do you know? Um, and, I, you know, I, I, it's kind of right, right at this moment in time, it's kind of hard to see out with that um position to to that kind of cinemascope view of what happens next i know it'll happen don't get me wrong i mean i think humans are kind of adaptable and resilient and you know we'll just find different ways of doing all the things that you know inspired us before but right at this moment in time when it's probably been almost exactly a year since we locked down um you know it's 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 interesting that you've posed that question and I'm a bit kind of, you know, um, it's, it's about the short term for me just now. I don't know about you. I mean, how, hmm. what do you feel? Well, there's what I feel personally and there's what I, f- I mean, I wish I'll answer, but there's also the element of the question. It's, it's really, really cool and fascinating that posing the question got you into quite an existential piece of introspection. <clears throat> um, yeah. And sometimes the question's more important than the answer and we don't need the answers. So, um, you know, if you think of this, uh, uh, my sense of, uh, I'm a frustrated creative, uh, as I told you, you know, out, out with, as we say in Scotland, this, um, talk, this conversation, you know, I wanted to go, I wanted to be an architect, but back then you had to draw and um, I can't draw. Uh, so, um, but I, I, I think I'm creative in different ways. But if I look at, I've done, I've done a lot of work around creatives. Uh, if I look at it in that, that scope, you can look at what comes next, what's next and always look in the future. And I think there's a couple of elements to me that I'd pick up. One is um, from a design standpoint, you are looking at what creates an experience where people can be present. Yeah. You look at architectural design, for example, ratios, aspects, building forms, designs. It's all about the experience you're creating for the end user. Yeah. Um, um, so there's, there is, there's definitely that, that, that element to it, this counterbalance between, you know, being present and what comes next in a professional standpoint so that other people can be present. Like, what's, yeah. the, pro- what's the problem you're solving for? The other element you talked about around, you know, and kind of an open exploration of self around, well, I'm afraid of standing still, is there's a there's a you know simple reference from a simple concept called growth mindset that I refer to quite a lot from um, Carol Dweck, and the you know the idea is that we are there are elements of life where we have a fixed mindset, like mm-hmm. we're convinced of something and. You know, when we have polarized conversations in public discourse, you know, there's no point in having it. You just go, you're probably right and move on and just let them yeah. think they won. Um, and that's a fixed mindset. Um, but the growth mindset um, is, you know, you're, if you're, so it can be from broadly, uh, my friend Chip Connolly, who's another past alumni of this show, um, would say that fixed mindset is about ego and fear. Yeah. Because you don't want to learn. Uh, whereas if you're growing, it's that's stretching, and yeah. that's all yeah. about. Imp- it's so to growth is to improve, fix is to prove is the way that Chip puts it. So it's you know fear can be a really useful driver, um, but only up to a certain point. Otherwise you freeze. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. 
Um, so actually, I think that the drive to always be learning and always looking at what's next, I think is innate. Um, and the more we're in that space, the more we are able to be uh, curious and engaged yeah. around learning. Um, that's the opposite of being in a fear space. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, I, I, th I think probably um, the, the kind of enforced isolation of this circumstance Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I may, maybe for all the reasons I mentioned earlier on, I don't look at it as having been um, something that is, is negative at all. You know, um, I, th I think probably I'd gone through three phases of this. You know, the starting point um, was a wee bit surreal. You know, the the we whilst our, our entire office was closed, um, we were doing the Louisa Jordan hospital in Glasgow for a month. Um, so I was still going to my work, you know, and albeit I was going to a different location for work than normally, but I was still going to the same city. I was leaving in the morning and coming home at night, you know. Um, and the thing that I hated most about going to work under normal circumstances had been taken away. <laughs> I hated the commuting, but because nobody else was on the roads, it, it, it was there was there was something kind of I I do I used to always go on about um, that I think I put I put so many hours into driving that M seventy seven that I should get I, I'd reached the point where I should be getting a lane a lane of my own for uh, you know thirty years service uh, for a year or something like that and then all of a sudden over that four weeks it had happened but there was something really weird about it you know and I wasn't quite sure by the end of that four weeks whether. That was something I really wanted, you know. Uh, so you wish for something and then you feel, uh, actually, maybe it's not quite what you, what you think. So then after that, you go through a period of um, spending a bit more time with your own flexibility in, at, at work. And the, the gradual realisation that, I maybe told you this before, but the gradual realisation that our office became really profitable and really efficient. Um, you know, we had already invested in, a way of working it uh, from home almost by accident before all this happened. Um, so you start to then think, you know, this is going to be difficult for us to actually return to a working environment that was previously, because we're going to have to accept that we'll become less efficient as an organisation because of it. So you, you start to lean into um, mm -hmm. the benefits of what that circumstance offer you, you know, both personally and professionally. But then when you get to the other side of just Christmas there and it feels like, hang on a minute, this is another cycle we're going through. It's dark, it's winter, it's... Yeah. You know, but I think when you start to look at that altered state, you know, lasting for a year, I this may be natural that your mental uh, element dips a bit. You know, and so there's been three distinct phases of this for me, but I, I suppose now I'm starting to get the feeling that it was a it was a pretty productive time for me, and things happened in that lockdown from a personal point of view that I don't think would have happened had mm -hmm. it been normal. I mean, we made a film, you know, yeah. uh, uh, of one of the books with a script, and if if that if because it was unusual and it was unique and it was a wee bit kind of different at the beginning, but if it had been trying to get that made as yeah. a normal film, we'd have got nowhere, you know, because people's money would have been getting spent elsewhere, and you know. Um, so it's a weird feeling to now look at that and think there's a lot to be thankful for. Mm -hmm. And I think to return to the, one of the other elements of it, I think it, it, it has prepared me better for retirement mm. in a funny kind of way, something that I was probably always a bit fearful of. Mm. But you get an insight into what your life might be like in that environment. And it, and it wasn't actually as, as bad as I thought that might be if, you know, a, a circumstance that you've been part of for 40 years is suddenly not there anymore, you know? Um, I don't know, it's, it's the kind of, I, I don't know how other people feel about the experience of having gone through all this, but probably I, I think I'm maybe relentlessly optimistic. So you begin to look at the things that inspire you to do something different. As I say, there's just that slight nagging bit that, you know, um, I wonder if we if we hadn't been able to do the film or I hadn't been able to put another book out or, you know, 
would, would I have felt differently that all of a sudden that creativity had just kind of stopped, you know? Um, but, you know, I suppose that's the, you look back at that and think, well, it's then up to you to just make that outlet happen in a different way, you know? So, yeah. I'm going to come back to you asking me the question, like, what did I think? Because this is a conversation, you know? It's like, yeah. um, on the one hand, so this balance between, you know, the, the altered state, great film, by the way, uh, altered states uh, from many years ago. Um, but it is an altered state and it's a different kind of consciousness. It's almost, you know, the altered states movie has flotation tanks and surreal scenes. And yeah, stuff. yeah, I remember it. And, um, <clears throat> so there's this balance between the next and, few, and, and present and the surreal present that we're in. Mm -hmm. And I, I do find it extremely surreal because um my life before the 12 months ago was lived often on zoom calls yeah the huge majority of people have never heard of zoom before a year ago mm -hmm. <clears throat> i've been on video for 12 since you could do video with enough bandwidth like yeah. at least at least 12 years i talk to people all around the world every day and so it is quite surreal seeing the different situations they're in and we're looking at things which are what's next. We're looking at what comes next for them individually, for the business. So my actual life hasn't changed a lot. And then I have to walk into a shop and I go, oh, I've got to put a face mask on. I know. I, I kind of disconnect from it a bit. The thing for me, though, is so generally I've, I've been exceedingly fortunate and privileged around all of this. Um, and but the, the sort of what's a common experience is... Um, there's a quote which I often reference from Blaise Pascal from it was mostly known for mathematics like 600 years ago. And if you translate it into English, broadly comes out to most of humanity's problems could be solved if people could learn to sit alone in an empty room. <laughs> right? um, and what it links to me a little bit is I was talking to some people the other day on a really niche field, which is supporting families who have really high levels of multi-generational wealth. They're never concerned about the money. Their issues are always yeah. around the relationships and the people because they mm -hmm. never invest in that. And one of the, the, the things that often comes up in these conversations is that people go from rags to riches to rags in three generations, right? So right. these are the highly privileged people financially in the world. But the human behavior around that is interesting. And the reference to this was there's a group called the Henokians, um, if I'm, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing it right. And it's 50 family businesses that have each been around for at least 200 years. Right. And what struck me is the two things. One is that your firm will have been around 200 years and not too long. Mm -hmm. So there's the legacy beyond the financial. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, and, you know, and, and there's things beyond money about what's next with all of that. But clearly there's, there's this responsibility to, to what it's about. And that's really rare and really special. Um, but what really struck me about that group when I looked them up on Wikipedia, because it wasn't deep research this time, <clears throat> the oldest of the companies is an inn in Japan that's been in the same family for nearly a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And you think, really, what are they doing? It's maybe 20, 30 rooms and they just, it's, a, it's an inn. They put people up. It's a hotel. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's being comfortable with what you have, right? There's a, there's a monk called David Steindl Rast who's done a great TED talk about the secret to happiness is to be grateful, not the other way around. Aye, aye. Um, so how, the roundabout way of saying, how am I doing? I generally, I'm absolutely great um, because I've downshifted my life a lot in recent years mm -hmm. to highly minimalize it. So I, I used to run a really big business and have 200 emails a day I'd need to clear. Mm -hmm. I don't do any deadline-based work and I only work with six clients at a time. Yeah. And I, I'm not interested in money. I'm interested in impact. And so generally, I'm really happy because if I can make a difference to people in any shape or form, that's, yeah. that's what drives me. <clears throat> I, but the only time I get that difficulty sitting in an empty room is if I'm not doing enough for that. And it's no longer about money. It might have been in my thirties, but it's no longer about money. Yeah. It's about what's the point of all of this? Because mm -hmm. like many people, I'm separated from my family. So yeah. it's interesting you talk about that, that sort of juxtaposition between present and future. Um, and 
yeah, it's that's where I am. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it's um, it's interesting when you know the. I I, I think. Um, I don't know if I if, if I. It, it's it, this is a terrible thing to admit, and I and I don't mean it to sound, you know, the way it might sound, but um, in, in quite a lot of ways, I'm personally grateful for what yeah. has has happened over the last um, twelve months or so. And I don't mean that. Obviously, there's there's, you know, there's been really terrible circumstances that have happened to a whole load of people, and that's the duality of even inferring that this hasn't necessarily been a terrible thing for me is something that I find quite difficult to admit, but it's the truth. You know, um, I, I think a wee bit of a reset in terms of mm -hmm. uh, reconnecting with family here, you know, um, and realizing to some extent that the work that we were doing and the hours and all the rest of it aren't, weren't necessarily the end of the world if if that if you if you were forced to do that in a different way you know and balance things in your life that wee bit better you know um obviously this is a pretty this, i mean it's a it's a dreadful thing to have happened to, to so many people you know yeah. and, and yeah. the economic impact and the mental health impact is going to go on for a long time so it's not it's not something i find easy admitting that um, to some extent for me personally, I'm, I'm, I've been kind of glad of what the circumstances it's forced me to go through, you know. Um, but, you know, you can only be honest to yourself, really. I think that's, there's, there's no point in denying that otherwise. Um, yeah, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how that would, how that will change me as an individual for the next five to ten years, let's say. Well, a couple of thoughts. One is um, we're a very similar age. And I, I joke that I retired 20 years ago because I changed the work I do. And I now, I, I love my work. I'm never going to stop working. Yeah. But even retirement, I just rewired. Yeah. yeah. So the first thing is what role might you play? And whether it's paid or unpaid, it's still work. I can't see you're going to sit in, in the garden and trim the tree uh, when, you, when you eventually... No, hand um, over the, um, the reins at the firm, etc. But it leads me on to a second thought um, of two, which is um, I was giving a lot of thought the other day, and I wrote about him in a daily blog to my late mentor Ed Percival, who, as David Brooks, the author of Second Mountain, talks about, there's a time at which you move beyond your resume or, or CV virtues to your eulogy virtues. What do you want people to say about you at your funeral? Mm -hmm. and the guy had the most amazing funeral. Right. Hundreds of people there for hours afterwards. Yeah. Leave, passing the mic, telling stories. Right. And there was a time uh, in the years that I knew him, we were both massive movie fans. And I know you like media and movies and stuff. And there was a quite odd um, science fiction, not science, but kind of action movie called Lucy came out a few years ago with Scarlett Johansson. Um, and the idea was around this premise that. Um, she was accidentally injected with some substance, which oh, yeah. in a very short period of time, her, she, instead of having, you know, this uh, now obviously debunked theory that we only use 10% of our brain, but she could have 100% use. So very, very quickly, she starts having super, almost superpowers. And she teleports her way into, uh, you know, takes over the television of Morgan Freeman, who's the world expert on this. And he, she says, look, I, I, you know, I don't know what to do with all this. I've, I've, I've got this, you know, my brain's, incredible I can answer everything right away and he just sits there and he goes our highest purpose is to share knowledge yeah, yeah. right and I think um I think you know in a very small way um if somebody asks you a good question and there's nothing if somebody in the coaching profession which broadly is how I can be categorized one of the things that you feel really good about if somebody says that's a good that's a great question mm-hmm mm -hmm. And if somebody's, if I've asked you a good question, it got you thinking, then um, whether it's just you, whether it's you and your direct family, whether it's something about your partners in the business, whether it's something that informs what you write about next or what you tweet about next, um, yeah. um, then you're sharing knowledge. 
And at the end of the day, um, there are a few things in life more important than that. No, you're right. You're right. So, yeah. And unexpectedly um, deep thinking conversation, but not, not, not in that you and I don't have those kind of conversations. We do. <laughs> um, but you never know where something's going to go when you just pose a question. Um, and it can go in all kinds of different contexts. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, the you know the thing I wanted to to uh, challenge you on was having got to understand the business you're in a bit in the last year. Um, is that uh, is this perspective? You love Kilmarnock, all right? Um, and you're a Glasgow <coughs> <coughs> a Glasgow architectural practice. Yeah. All right. But the reason why, what you explained to me a while ago, is the reason why, one of the reasons why you're able to remote learning is, you know, I challenge you, you're not a Glasgow architectural practice. You're an international oh, yeah, yeah. And design practice that happens to be based in Glasgow. Yeah. But one of the things we could do a lot more of as humans, particularly Brits and, and Scots, is to allow the light to shine on us, you know, and actually say that. And I met you when I was asked to spend a day just hanging out with and supporting an amazing Kilmarnock entrepreneur that we both know, Mar Marie Macklin. And at a point when it was kind of a reasonably pivotal point on this huge project she wanted to do, which was to effectively to me, bring confidence to the, the town of Kilmarnock. Mm -hmm. And I've just been watching her social media and it's going up. Yes. Yeah. It's being fitted out. And I know you guys are the architects on it, right? And it's like, that's incredible. That's, that's a, a world-class project that sits already sits next to the college, which itself is yeah. a world-class piece of architecture and world-class project. Yeah. And you can take a town, which is one of the most impoverished postcodes in the UK, right? That's seen, you know, industrial shrinkage in, in a huge way. Yeah. You can stick at the, the most key point of land in the town. These two world-class landmarks and... I'm just shoehorning this in because I'm just, you know, and and the Louisa Jordan and all this stuff. Like there's some, you know, my only, I guess my thought would be, and I'm saying it kind of publicly, is uh, my, my mentor, Ed, he was coaching for over 50 years, both sports coaching and then leadership coaching, business coaching. And simplic there was this chap called Da Vinci you might have heard of. And apparently he said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Absolutely. Yeah. And Ed distilled everything he learned into three words. Be more you. Yeah. yeah. So for me, what's next is to always look to grow, to stretch. And yeah. Be yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know that I'm just incredibly proud of what we've uh, achieved here, you know, um, mainly because I think it demonstrates that the people of the town are worth it. You know, and there's a, there's a value to... Yeah. what they are and what they do and what their identity is, you know, and I think um, that demonstration of sort of re value through regeneration of moving from one identity to the next, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a kind of perennial thing for architects, you know, so um, it, it, the, the reason that the, the what comes next question is interesting from an architectural point of view is because it's perceived to be quite a slow moving art you know, um, but in actual fact, things things change a lot more rapidly than people uh, acknowledge at times. It's just that their memories are wrapped up in things that, as if they were always there, or if, you know. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a good it's a good subject to be asking that question of. <laughs> yeah, and uh, because I wasn't probably clear about it, and because I don't do show notes, the the project's called Halo, and it's, it's called Halo, yes. And um, the, if you want to Google, anybody wants to Google the leader of that, it's Marie, M-A-R-I-E, Macklin, M-A-C-K-L-I-N. And she is a force of nature, that lady. Yeah, there's, 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 ins there's some inspirational people around, but she's I'll, one, of the, can you imagine this one of the top ones. Yeah. Um, all right, so as, as I do, I'll, my guests will have the last word before we wrap up. What's the last word? I was thinking about, um, you know, you, you mentioned looking ahead to funerals and obituaries and things like that. And I think all I would want for, I'm going to use a good Glaswegian word here, Scottish word does, all I would want on my epitaph is he wasn't a fud. <laughs> a good way to finish. 
<laughs> I think I think I think I think my, my old dad would be quite chuffed if um you know people turned up at his funeral and you know universally and, and righteously said his son wasn't a fud. <laughs> so now now anybody looking listening to this later around the world is gonna to have to Google what's a fud. And uh, and and any other Glaswegian uh, slang words, you know. Yeah, and you know I've just got a vision of you doing the audio book reading for one of your books. And just, uh, I remember when uh, train, I'm, I'm jumping in with a bit before I finish. Uh, when train spotting came out, I was living in the Cayman Islands and they put subtitles on Ewan McGregor. Oh, right, for a Scotsman, you're going, he went to Morrison's Academy in Creef and that's a pretty posh accent. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we better not get into too much uh, localized conversation. No. It's been an absolute pleasure, David. Um, many it's, times. It's on. Good to see you looking so well. And you. Cheers. Thank you.